All right, gang, in this week's lecture, we're going to be talking about the different types of retail formats. So obviously, more and more of us are now shopping online, and retail channels are scrambling to survive in the Amazon era. That being said, there's still a lot of things that we purchase in a traditional retail store format, and I'm going to cover these retail concepts as they are part of the channel of distribution or place component of our course discussion. So two primary learning objectives for this week's lecture. I want you to know the different types of retail formats and we'll cover the five main types. And then secondly, understand how the shoppers are different between those who shop online and uh, those who shop in a traditional store setting. So let's talk about the first of the five main retail formats. So this category of store, and you see a picture here of Target, we call these guys mass merchandisers, also known as a discount store. So you know the retail formats, as I go through this lecture, they're always kind of shifting and changing in size. You might have a specialty store that ends up being a large mass merchandiser and a department store like Sears that ends up becoming a specialty store just to try to survive. So these formats aren't fixed. They're just ways of describing uh, retailers and if you ever work in the retail business so if they're leasing in malls they talk about these different types of format sizes so mass merchandisers these are large self-service stores there's not a lot of sales help out on the floor and they traditionally used to sell soft goods and staples so staple products like paper towels and soft goods detergent all that kind of stuff so obviously we've seen now that both Walmart and Target have moved into food. So they're trying to steal some of the uh, grocery stores dollars as well. So, but this category is called mass merchandisers. Another type of retail that you may or may have not visited is a convenience store, also known as a C store. So convenience stores used to exist to provide a place to shop after the grocery stores closed because there was a period when grocery stores weren't open late night like they are nowadays or 24 hours like many of them are now. So if you were a new family and your baby was out of diapers and it was two in the morning, you could get in the car and run to 7-Eleven get uh, diapers there. Now obviously grocery stores are mostly open 24 seven. So convenience stores, have had to kind of shift and have more of a focus on food. So when you walk into a convenience store, you'll still see some shelving with some traditional things that you might need like toilet paper, uh, but you're gonna see um, less of that and more of the foods and snack stuff in there as well. So they tend to have what's called um, a little bit of, you know, a fair amount of breadth, but not a lot of depth. So breadth is a little bit of everything. They maybe have like one or two brands of toothpaste but not like a grocery store where you go and they'll have like 12 or 15 brands of toothpaste. So a little breadth, a little bit of everything, but not a lot of depth, not a lot of different choices of brands within their offerings. So, and again, these, uh, this concept is morphing uh, more towards food as grocery stores have worked to take away their business and then mass merchandisers like Walmart and Target have morphed to start stealing away from grocery stores. You can see kind of the competitive arena here as people are scrambling to survive. We also have specialty stores. Uh, if you've gone to a mall lately, and we have many here in San Diego, but you know, malls are typically uh, anchored by large tenants at the ends of the malls. We call those anchor tenants, and those traditionally used to be department stores, like a Sears. So department stores have been struggling, so we're seeing different types of anchors. And in some shopping centers, the anchor might even be like a Target or a category killer, uh, like an Ikea. So, and then within the malls, you go uh, down the line, you'll see all the specialty stores. So specialty stores are like, uh, they have a kind of a perceived higher quality and perceive better service on a specific line of products. So like Pottery Barn is all things homes and home furnishings. You can go to Victoria's Secret and it's uh, women's lingerie and underwear and things of that nature. Uh, Ritz Camera, which is all things related to cameras. So when they have a perceived higher quality and perceived higher service, that's a specialty store. 
Then you also have another category called category killers. So kind of an interesting name, a category killer. And these are also known as big box retailers. So big box retailers began originally with Toys R Us was the first big box retailer. And they're called a big box retailer because they have a very large store, a giant box, if you will. And uh, they have a single product line that's mass merchandise. So Toys R Us was the first category killer. All things toys, giant store, and they kill the category for any of the other retailers in the neighborhood that are trying to sell, in this case, toys. So nowadays, if you're a, uh, say, a true value hardware store, and that's a franchise operation, and they're all over the United States, and they've been around for quite a while, but there's a, there's a company that's struggling because they're getting moved in on by category killers like Home Depot, right, and Lowe's. So these are giant stores that come in, and they have all things related to home improvement. So these other little small mom and pops, uh, they get killed, hence killing the category when a large big box retailer comes into the neighborhood. So single product line, like Ikea, all things home furnishings, combined with mass merchandising, like we saw before with Walmart. And you see some examples down here, as I mentioned, Toys R Us was the first one. Toys R Us, interestingly enough, uh, you know, they're from New Jersey. They, a couple of the founders of that company left and came to San Diego and formed a new category killer called Petco. So Petco is headquartered here in San Diego and I used to work for that company. And then we still had supermarkets, so or grocery stores as we might also call them. So, you know, in other parts of the country, people still uh, shop and they'll go to one, they'll go to a butcher store just to get their meat and they'll go to a vegetable place just to get that. And, you know, so they kind of make all these different trips. So the supermarkets are starting to pervade the world and become more common as these uh, mass merchandisers and these retail concepts spread across the U.S. So, and you've seen these guys get more upscale, right? So there's a push towards more organic and sustainable food and higher prices to go with it. And then we also have department stores. So department stores have been a staple in the U.S. really since, uh, you know, regional shopping centers kind of took root you know, starting in the 60s. So, and these were, you know, a very large store with many different, if you will, specialty stores underneath under one brand. So kind of like a mall within a mall. If department stores as a whole have been struggling to remain profitable. And you can probably think of a couple reasons why. They're getting attacked from a lot of different fronts. Why do people go to department stores in the first place? Well, if you think about it, uh, a department store has kind of staple products like linens and, and clothing and, and dishware, things you're going to get for your house. But you can go to a specialty store like a Williams-Sonoma or a Pottery Barn and get perceived higher quality stuff at one of those locations. So why would you go to a department store? Uh, also losing business uh, from category killers on kind of baseline stuff that you might buy every day. So they don't really have a point of difference. There's category killers, single line mass merchandise. If you need anything for your home, you're not going to go to Sears and get uh, Craftsman tools when you can go to Home Depot, right? So, and then if you want nicer stuff, you're probably not going to register for your wedding at Sears, right? You're going to do that at uh, Williams Sonoma or Pottery Barn or one of those places. So that combined with the online component, department stores are struggling. Uh, you know, Sears, which has been around for a long time, one of the biggest, you know, original retailers in the United States, is struggling to, to survive. You still see department stores kind of back in the Midwest, but on the West and East Coast, uh, they're struggling as specialty stores kind of, um, kind of start on the East and West Coast and, and take hold. So stay tuned for the future of department stores. And we've seen a lot of consolidation as one department store brand buys another one as they try to survive um, the declining sales. Next, I want to talk about online sales. Certainly when we talk about retail, we're typically thinking brick and mortar store. And that's still a big chunk of retail sales. But the biggest growth, obviously, with Amazon and everything that we're seeing online is the growth of online sales. 
On this slide, you see the numbers from 2018 to 2017 to 2016 and the continued growth of retail sales that are done online, buying products online. And the bottom statistic there is the most staggering that all of the growth, or at least uh, the majority of the growth, almost 52% of retail sales growth came from e-commerce sales. So this trend is going to continue as people get more and more comfortable with buying products online. And There's this concept called showrooming. And showrooming is now with the internet and all the online purchasing, what's happening for traditional retailers where they have an actual store is customers will go into the store and kind of look around and see if what they're looking to buy is the right size and shape and if they like it. They won't buy it at the store. They'll leave the store and then go home and do what? They purchase it online. I know I did this when I was looking to buy a mountain bike. Uh, I was trying to find what frame size and type of bike worked for me. And then I left the store and I went and bought it online. So, And interestingly enough, that bike shop closed uh, about six months later. <laughs> so, uh, you know, their showrooming is going on. Um, U.S. luxury retailers, which have actually been really solid for many, many years, despite the ups and downs of the economy. People are super wealthy, uh, still go to luxury retailers, and, and those brands have been pretty stable. Well, they're finally now starting to see some declines and also losing some sales to online purchases. And you can see here on my last bullet point uh, how online sales uh, are really um, starting to bite into re, uh, traditional retailer sales. So in 2017, 13% of all retail sales were online sales. So these numbers have been pacing up quite a bit. You can see uh, 2010, 2011, and then more recently 2017, 453 and a half billion dollars in online retail sales. So the numbers keep getting larger and a lot of the growth has been because of Amazon. Okay, so that covers the different retail concepts and some of the other terms that relate to retail. So those apply to this week's quiz, discussion, and assignment. Thank you for listening.